Hey everyone. So, um, as David just said, I'll be talking about game-based learning. So this is all about a bit of playfulness in higher education. So I've been doing game-based learning um, and gamification basically since I, I became a lecturer and started down this path. Uh, and I was actually doing it before I realised um, that it was a thing I could actually do. I didn't realise that gamification was a process in higher education. I was just bringing a bit of levity uh, to some of my sessions. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is some of my experiences and some of the things I've created uh, within games-based learning, how you can use these games within capstone projects as well, um, and general playful learning for remote teaching, because a lot of the games I'm going to talk about are things that I've used hard copy in the class where, you know, you would have that discussion with students directly. So moving gamification into a remote teaching environment can be a little bit difficult. So I've got some ideas of, of how it can be done just to bring a bit of uh, levity to the sessions. So in terms of uh, my playful learning teaching, some of the things I've done, so I do a lot of small things in sessions, whether it's just doing a, a quiz or bingo and things like that. But this, these two examples you can see on the screen um, are two published examples that you can read up on if you want, but they also demonstrate game-based learning in the lab and game-based learning in a classroom. So on the left there, we have uh, my session on try hard pipetting. So if anyone's seen Die Hard with a Vengeance, this is the scene in Die Hard with a Vengeance where you have the three gallon and the five gallon jug, and they have to put exactly four gallons of water onto the scale to disarm the bomb. Now, given this is a 90s movie, um, obviously I have to ask the students first of all who's seen it, normally about four, so then I will play that, that clip so that they understand what ex exactly it is that we're going to do. So the first step they do is actually solve that problem. How do you get a four gallons from a three gallon and a five gallon jug? So that kind of draws them together into their teams and their friendship groups of who they're going to work with and they solve the problem. And we then go through the, the solution to the water jug problem. I then introduce them to the problem we have in class, which is a set of scale set up. Uh, and I have a little briefcase with just some plasticine in it that I've labeled as C4 saying, well, we have a bomb in the lab and we need to make sure that this bomb doesn't detonate. We need to uh, make sure we can diffuse this. So they have a 0.5, 1.5 and 2 mil tube and they have a set amount of solution in each one of those tubes, which they then have to transfer using only a 200 microliter pipette. So they can't change the volume on that. They have to work out what the transfers are going to be in order for that solution to change over. Um, and they obviously have to do that accurately. So once they think they've got the solution to that problem, we then weigh those tubes and we see how accurate they've been with their pipetting. So this is all about accuracy and precision in the pipetting process. So they work in their groups, they solve the problem. I don't tell them if the answer to their problem is right or not. I just get them to do it with the tubes. We also make sure the sides are, are, are kind of blacked out on the side so they can't use any measurements there too. And then they do their transfers, bring it to the front of the class, and then they'll weigh them out. And as they do, I write down on the board exactly what the uh, measurements are for each one. They have a small percentage error. And if they go beyond that, we have a sound effect in the class. We have an explosion, we detonate the bomb. But what I found happens with this is that when they get it wrong or if they're inaccurate, there isn't that feeling of that they've failed or that they're no good at it. They find it amusing. And what the first thing they do is go, can I have another set of tubes we want to try again? So it's just a different approach because first of all, it just demonstrates calibration and accuracy in you know, a, a bit more of an interesting way than just talking about it. And it also means that if they do get it wrong, they have fun and they want to try again doing it. Um, so that's the session that I've used within the LAMP environment. The one on the right there is a game um, a board game that I've created called Park Life. And this came about because I was teaching within uh, the conservation module for zoology, but obviously my background's forensics. So I was talking about, all about wildlife crime and wildlife forensics. And I thought, how can I draw all these concepts of conservation and then all the aspects of wildlife crime and wildlife forensics together so that they can understand how they all knit together as well. So the creation of that was Park Life. That was all these different concepts they come across to do with um, stud books, to do with uh, wildlife crime, to do with poaching, to do with ecotourism, and this game was created. So you can see there you have four individual boards, so it's a four player game. You have to build up your land, which is the green squares uh, for your resources. You have to have one square, which you can see at the top there, which is blue, which is your water resource. And then you build up your breeding pairs. So that's the, the black and white cubes. So you move your way around the board, um, resolving all of the actions. And to win the game, you have to have a full nature reserve, um, fully fenced off, and a certain amount of money in the bank. You also have a stud book that you have to fill in. So at the end of the game, someone can pick up any animal off of any square and say, where has this come from? And you have to get the lineage of that animal and obviously make sure you have no inbreeding. So it was a way of bringing all of those concepts together 
in a fun way because it's towards the end of the module and it's a way for them to revise everything and see how it all fits together. So they're two of the um, bigger things that I've done in terms of gamification, but it demonstrates that you can do this in the lab or in that classroom environment. So in terms of using these for dissertations, for the capstone projects, um, this was for, to cater for those students who don't want to go and work in the lab, you know, who do a science-based degree, but don't want to follow that path, you know, think they want to go into teaching. They may know that even when they start their degree that that's going to be their path. So this presents an opportunity for them to use that science knowledge, but apply it within a, a teaching a, a principle. So using this in terms of games based projects, it was for two reasons. One is it was for my own research. I can get some kind of pilot studies underway that the, uh, the students can do, but it introduces them to teaching, to pedagogy um, and understanding teaching approaches. So normally what they would do is go out into the school, teach a class in kind of a traditional way, in a game based way, and then look at the difference in those uh, students in terms of how they enjoyed the session, how they retain the information, um, and they tend to find that projects aimed at years kind of three to 13 it is all about teaching, whereas projects where I have with uh, students at higher education who do it within the university, normally to foundation and level four students, make it more activity based. Um, and that's normally due to that change as they get to higher education that it's a lot more independent. So they tend to create things in terms of study groups and revision um, and the game based projects come from that rather than actually teaching by this method. So obviously that analysis is then some quantitative analysis of test scores, but then the qualitative analysis as well in terms of uh, the opinions from students and possibly teachers as well if they've gone into a school. So creativity is the key to all of this. So you don't have to be you know, a complete gaming mastermind. It doesn't have to be the thing that you do every day of the week. Obviously some knowledge of games uh, is useful for you to kind of feed off where those ideas are coming from, but that can just come from your knowledge of you know, Rummy, Scrabble, Monopoly, and these kind of game dynamics of how things work. So as with all projects, um, the students are going to feed off your ideas and your enthusiasm for it, but you've got to find out firstly with gamification what it is that kind of makes them tick. So asking them just what kind of games they play, are they a tabletop gamer, do they do computer games, online gaming, because that will be the lead in to the type of game based learning that they do, because that's their world, that's what they understand, um, and that's their background knowledge because the, the key thing you've got to remember going into this as well in terms of a teaching project is that for anything else um, lab-based, they've had that three years training of the degree. That's, that's the purpose of it, you know, to get to this capstone project that they're gonna use all that knowledge and put it to the test essentially. Whereas doing something like this in terms of education, it's not an area that they're used to. They haven't got anything to go on previously. So you are going to have to lead them through in terms of literature and support a little bit more because it is completely new to them at that stage. Um, so it does mean you just got to give them a little bit more support with this type of project. Uh, so this is just a little bit of a demonstration of some of the game paced uh, projects that I've done with students. So on the far left there we've got some cards that were generated by a student looking at reactivity of metals um, and this literally just sparked off that we found these images someone had created on Etsy and we thought well that'd be really good to introduce into a game. Um, so we created a kind of top trumps style of game to take into a school. So working with year seven students um, and they just played the deck. So looking at the reactivity of metals and then put some special effects onto them as well. So the, the gaming elements in there that it wasn't just the numbers and the win. There was other things that they could add on either multiple cards or special effects for cards as well. And it meant that they retained the information in terms of was that calcium card that did that? Was that the helium card that did that? And it was just a different way of learning. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, I've had a couple of projects on. Uh, the most recent one was kind of a way to do a crime scene investigation with forensic students without having to have the time and resource incentive um, for using the forensic training facility. So essentially putting students into a mock environment, giving them roles of a crime scene manager, a photographer, whatever it might be, but actually talking them through that story. So the IS student was the, the games master, the, the kind of the, the quiz leader, and they were telling what the story was. So they gave the background uh, of the crime scene, and then the students who were participating walked through. So they had to collect evidence. How are you gonna collect the evidence? You know, what type of packaging would it be? And the students had to work together in order to do that correctly in terms of forensic science knowledge to then work out um, this crime scene. And that worked really well with the students. So we're gonna try and develop that one a little bit more because it does mean that we can do more crime scene training with them. Uh, I had another student who used the headbands game who went into uh, a year six class 
So you can change this with headbands in any way for so whatever they're teaching, put the image of it onto a headband and they have to guess what it is via questions that they're asking the rest of the class. So it's just a simple way in terms of understanding different concepts um, because obviously the person asking the question has to be able to work out the answer um, and the, the rest of the participants obviously have to know the responses of what's going on. So it's an easy game to, to just adapt. Timeline as well is another game that's out there uh, where you have a certain deck of cards. So this one on the screen is the inventions deck uh, and each one is a different invention. So you can see you've got fire building and things like that. And you just work around the group. So you draw your card and you go, where in the timeline do I think fire building comes? You place it in the timeline, you turn it over to look at the dates. And if you fit it within the right um, area of the timeline, it stays there. If not, it draws back into your hand. Uh, and obviously it's another one that's really easy to adapt uh, in terms of the content. So if you've got anything that you need to know, kind of a, a, you know, a linear structure, time of events, then timeline is, is the easy one to go to for an adaptation. So having that games knowledge means that if you know about timeline, then you know a way to adapt it in that way. So it just gives you that additional support when creating these projects to begin with. So I say these generally two approaches. So you can get students to create an entirely unique game, but this does take a lot more time, uh, a lot more creativity as well to in order to devise something, to play test it, make sure it works. So when I created Park Life, it took me sort of the whole summer to get it to a functional game. The first version that I did of it, I play tested it with my husband and we were both dead in 15 minutes because it was just far too harsh of a game. So it takes a lot of play testing to actually get these things to work. Um, it can be slower for a pick up and play if they're doing it in dissertation that they need to take it to a class because there's a lot more you need to describe to a room. Whereas if you go, okay, we're going to play a game, it's like Monopoly or it's like Scrabble, then instantly people can draw on that knowledge of what they need to do. Okay? And then there's the hook as well. So if you're saying it's a game like this, then again, they know what it is rather than I've created a game, let's see if you enjoy it, which instantly for some students might be, oh, let's see what you've made. Um, so the easier option is the reworked game. So like the ones I've just demonstrated with things like timeline and headbands, um, you can take a current game that you can just pull off the shelf and just change the content of it. So you're looking at the creativity of the subject information there and not the method of delivery. So you don't have to do the play test of does the game work, that's already been resolved. You're just changing what the content is. So occasionally, like I says there, you can have both. So it might be that you get a student to review current games and they see what works and doesn't work and create something on their own. So I've had students look at general sort of CSI games and see how accurate they are um, and could they be used in an educational environment. So it might be that you have had a little bit of both sometimes as well. So obviously I'm talking a lot, a lot about tabletop games and card games, things like that. There is obviously this huge shift in terms of digital games, computer games, but in terms of a dissertation project, that's going to be entirely reliant on the student that you have. Um, I personally have no knowledge in terms of video game creation, of even using Python or anything like that. But I have a student this year who's come to me and said that, yes, I would like to create a game. I said, well, what knowledge do you have? Oh, yeah, I've coded in Python. It's fine. I've created things before. So them having that knowledge that's nothing to do with their degree is then going to help them within that kind of capstone project. So it will be based on the knowledge that your student has coming in. Um, it can be a bit more risky because of the, the problems that you can encounter with the digital application. And it's easier for the student to create a bad game because if it doesn't look um, very appealing to the students, they're kind of instantly going to switch off because they're just going to you know, think that it doesn't look like a good game to begin with before they've even started playing. So there is a bit more risk to be considered with that one. Now in the current climate, obviously I said the students would normally go out to a school and they would deliver the session at primary, secondary level uh, or with groups of students in terms of higher education. Obviously it's very unlikely that we'll be able to do that now but you do get these different opportunities. So actually what they can do is develop some resources or downloadable content that can be passed to schools. They can give it out in case there is any more home learning or extra support that needs to go on. Um, and it means that putting in that game context means the person delivering the game doesn't have to have that subject knowledge. You shouldn't have to be an expert in whatever that game is delivering in order to actually play it. So it's a way of uh, delivering material to schools that anyone can pick up and play and the learning is kind of hidden within that game uh, as they're uh, delivering it to students. Um, it is a new way of delivering that material and possibly aiding revision as well. So rather than just, you know, sitting down with a book, learning something through, it might be a taught concept in the classroom, but then you've got a game to just reinforce that information. Um, and especially more for higher education students uh, working in isolation or partially isolated, things like running um, a Dungeons and Dragons session, you know, getting everyone onto Zoom and running through a crime scene like that, 
is another way that you can bring everyone together. So it's slightly a social element, but then also you've got obviously the application of knowledge as well. So there are obviously some hurdles. So depending on your programme, you need to check uh, what your accreditation status says about this for doing this type of project for a capstone project. Are they required to do um, certain work or certain laboratory work? Or are you okay to take this kind of education approach? You have got the switch to qualitative analysis and questionnaire design within this type of project. So if you are purely kind of quantitative, that is a switch to do. And there was, we were speaking in previous webinars about this, about that change over to the qualitative that you just do that step by step, like slowly introducing that to your research so that you have the knowledge as well as the student bringing it as well. Um, I've mentioned about obviously this being difficult from the student from the beginning because you have to go, well, this is a, a new area of literature. This is what you need to look at. There is the science side of this, but there is obviously the teaching element. So they won't even have heard uh, about the words that you're talking about in terms of teaching theory. So you do need to give them that extra push to begin with so they know what direction to look. Um, they can also have difficulty seeing the big picture in terms of what this means rather than just I did a test and that was better than that or what does that mean in the big picture in terms of teaching approaches and, and where does that fit. Um, obviously it requires development and play testing if you're creating a game um, but that's no different than if you're doing lab work and having to do pilot studies in the background for that. Um, probably one of the most difficult things is finding the audience and the participants to do this. So getting a school to sign up to it um, or even getting higher education students to just have the time to, uh, to be involved in that research. Um, so you've got to set that challenge appropriately for your students' knowledge. So find out what sort of games they're interested in. And then normally the rest will follow quite naturally. I tend to keep these projects quite open in terms of a title and just say, you know, this is an education project based on um, looking at retention and memory of information using games. So it's nice and vague so then we can have that discussion and I can go, okay, you're interested in World of Warcraft, you're interested in Dungeons and Dragons, you play tabletop games every night and we find out that interest and go from there and that will normally um, give the answer to what that project's going to be. Okay, so then the last thing I'm going to talk about is the game-based learning in the context of remote teaching um, that we're going to be going into. So what I'm going to go through now is actually available as a separate PDF that you can interact with. Um, but I'll quickly run through these ideas just so you can get um, some of them and see if they're of interest to you. So we've got 10 ideas on here for playful learning for remote teaching. So the two at the top on the shoulder buttons, um, they're the, probably the ones that people will know the most. So things like digital badges and utilising digital platforms like Socrative and Kahoot to create the games as well. Um, and the rest of the ideas around the side, um, why we'll go through now and we'll have a look in a little bit more detail but there's a lot of information here, so I, I won't go into full detail for everyone. So with each of these ideas as well, they all um, cater to a different need in terms of remote teachings, be that engagement, independent learning, or the social aspect that we're going to struggle with. Um, so by combining some of these ideas, you can get some combos. So a combo for engagement, the independent learning and the social side of things. So you don't have to pick one, you can use multiple ones if you wish. Uh, so the first is to do a choose your own adventure. So if you remember uh, the books from back in the day that you would read along, you get to the end of a page and you would choose the adventure of where you're going to go next and it would tell you what page to turn to. So turning that into a kind of a case study within a module, especially if you're the person that's teaching a lot of that module, means that every week you can talk your uh, students through the next step of the scenario and ask the question of what decision they're going to make. So I've got an example here just because I'm from forensics. So in our forensics cohort, we might introduce them in week one in terms of health and safety at scene and search strategies. So the case study would be, we describe a scene to them and ask them, well, what search strategy are you gonna use? What's the approach? So if you have three possible set answers maybe, and then they can pick one of those and then you would lead them into the next bit of scenario where they'll start next week. So they don't necessarily have to choose the right answer. So the ones that want to make sure they've done it appropriately may always choose the correct answer. Some may just naturally get it wrong, but then that will sort of be insinuated by what the um, solution is going to be for the next week or what they fall into. So maybe a piece of evidence isn't able to be used in court or something like that. Or you might just have students that want to break this game and will do the worst possible things just to see what happens within the adventure. And that's also fine because this is supposed to be fun, they're supposed to enjoy it. And by doing that, by trying to break the game, they know that that is the wrong answer. So they're demonstrating that they know what the right answer is, but I'm going to ignore it. So it's just a little bit of fun and it enables kind of a real world learning in a way to walk them through a scenario and see what would happen at the end of it if they made all of those decisions. If you want, you can even create some characters and they can play those throughout the game as well. 
So you can also do some breakout games. So if we're doing you know, Zoom lectures, collaborate lectures like this, if you have long three, four hour sessions and you wanna break up lectures, even if it's just a one hour lecture, you can come to a slide and just give everyone a bit of light relief and just have a bit of a breakout game. So maybe you've got some new vocabulary you want to make sure the students are picking up. So you can use things like countdown conundrums, you could use uh, the white screen and play Pictionary on there, see if they come up with the concepts. Or if you've seen something like uh, the great big fat quiz of the year, where they have these quizzes at the bottom where you have to work out what the pictures are and then tie it all together. Um, so here, obviously, we've just got convergent evolution, evolution. But if you're going to use these, it's making sure you have diversity and, and multiple ones tied in, because some students really might struggle with things like a conundrum, whereas using Pictionary might be fine. So just mixing it up so uh, you cater for those mixed cohorts that you're going to go teaching throughout. Uh, you can use some in-lecture games as well. So if you don't want to stop the lecture to, to play a game, you could use Easter eggs or you could do a bit of lecture bingo. So Easter eggs might be things that you have on the screen. So we've got some laboratory glassware as well, there as well. So either they just have to note them down or you might say that you have to note exactly what it is. And therefore you're testing the knowledge of um, making sure they understand exactly what the terminology is and they don't just put something like flask and um, you could use it for um, hazard signs and things like that in the lab as well making sure they know what they are so they can note them as they go through so you're making sure that they're actually engaging with the slides that you're putting up on the screen and noting these easter eggs and then you can reveal at the end how many they should be and see who got them all and um, the lecture bingo as well again if you've got a lot of new vocabulary i have a lot of lectures like this where if i teach something like phylogenetics, there might be 40 new words in there they've never heard of before. So I'll highlight them on the slides, issue everyone with a bingo sheet just from a free website, and they have to note them and get lines and diagonals as they go through, which they can then put their hands up um, and or shout out bingo, whatever you want in your lecture. So again, it's just a way for the get them to interact with these slides. Uh, a wiki adventure is something you can set if you want to do just a very simple pop quiz, 10, 20 questions at the end of a session, just to make sure they've uh, got the information. So the example I have here, here is a first year genetics. Often we talk about the discovery of the structure of DNA. Um, so it's something that's always talked about, but rather than just saying, you know, have you got the basic information and here's 10 top questions, you can send them on that wiki adventure. So I think we should embrace the fact that students are going to Google things. They are just going to look it up, even if it's in your slide, they are going to just go to Google and try and find the answer. So if we reinforce that and say, okay, use Wikipedia to find all of the answers. So the first instruction might be, go to Google and put wiki discovery of DNA. And then we'll go to that first Wikipedia page, which takes you to the DNA one. So your first quest in the wiki adventure is then find the gentleman FC who jointly discovered the structure of DNA. And they have to read through the DNA page until they find the answer, which is Francis Crick. And then they click on Francis Crick, it takes them through to that page and your next quest, uh, the solution to that will be in the Francis Crick page. So you can let that go on as long as you want, you can keep it nice and simple, or you can throw in a few curveballs and see if you get them to go off down the wrong path and if they understand that they're going down the wrong path by doing that. Uh, module scoreboards, um, out of everything I'm demonstrating here, this is probably the most time intensive for you. Um, and they are something that have to be handled delicately. So I never say that you should put you know, a scoreboard of just attainment for, for the entire class and have people at the bottom. I don't think scoreboard should only be anything more than a top five or top 10, um, but it's a way for getting them to engage with them. So you're getting a, an actual reward for attending or for doing other things in terms of engagement with the module. So you don't want someone to be losing or feel like they're failing because they had a doctor's appointment and couldn't turn up one day and therefore didn't get the points. But if they catch up with that material and complete a formative test, or if they tweet out some relevant information, they can gain the points back in that way and possibly even more points. So then a student that does all of these things will be very highly scoring, but even someone that's just attending but not doing anything else will then range in the middle. And you're just kind of creating um, this guidance for them of where they are in terms of the engagement with the module. Um, so another good thing to do is create hashtags for your module. And um, so students can just tweet things out and that can be directly linked to the VLE as well. So if they're not on Twitter, they can see what everyone else is sharing. So you're encouraging people to speak up maybe in a collaborate session, but enabling those who don't have the confidence to do that to engage in a different way as well. Uh, pop quizzes and pop quizzes are something that you can um, encourage the students to do. So in terms of uh, the pop quiz, you can get them to use quiz apps like Quizmaker. They will just go online, create some uh, questions, and then they can email them directly from the app onto their friends. 
So after a session, they create five questions and they're essentially doing a research um, kind of vision study group um, without doing that round a table, sending quizzes over uh, an app to each other and following up via the email. Um, or if you really want to encourage the social side, you can say, well, on a Zoom night, maybe there's going to be a, a pub quiz, set it up with your friends. Uh, and each of you submit five general knowledge questions like a normal pub quiz and five topic questions. So they're testing the, the academic side and then just a bit of fun in terms of general knowledge as well. So you just could just encourage, especially first year students to do that and um, to do a pub quiz on a weekly basis. OK, use of technology in terms of there's an app for that. Um, so the example I have here is for field work identification for species. So there's loads of apps out there for plant identification, insect identification, these kinds of things. So you could send students out into their local area and get them to do identification and even gather all that information back to look at it um, on a kind of a national basis, depending on where students are at that time, or just plot in the local area, see who finds the most species, see who finds the rarest, or even if you think the apps are no good, as it says there, send them out with the apps and with dichotomous keys and see if they get the same result for these as well. Um, there is a research application to this as well. So there are some papers that have looked at these identification tools in terms of uh, citizen science and how accurate it is. Um, so there are multiple applications with this one. Uh, exit tickets and escape rooms. Again, things you might be at least aware of if not having used. So exit ticket is normally just a question you ask for a student to actually leave a session and show them on the phone. But you could do that in terms of uh, logging out of a lecture as well. Obviously, there's no way to stop them from just leaving the room. But if you set it up, set it up in terms of maybe a crystal maze environment, if you do it every week, give them you know, a virtual crystal or something if they if they get the quiz right, get the map, change it from the, you know, the Aztec Centre to whatever topic it is you happen to be studying and put up a picture of the room that they're in when they're answering that question. So just building the environment a little bit more than just asking a question at the end of a session. Uh, and escape rooms as well um, are more intensive in terms of time, um, but are growing in popularity. Um, and academics like Dr. Emma Thurkle, she's just created a 10 step guide on how to create one in EndNote. So just using kind of free software, if you know what I mean, for, for academics to be able to use this. Um, and that is available uh, over Twitter for guidance. Um, but I think a lot of people are getting into the escape room environments now. Uh, digital badges, maybe something you already use. Or if, like me, you said you would absolutely use them three or four years ago and then a hundred other things got onto the you actually looked into it. You know, now, now is probably the time to look into digital badges a little bit more. However, if judging by really that would be a little bit plain or maybe not do what you want it to, maybe have the digital badges there and create your own kind of sticker book that if the students get so many digital badges, you send them a sticker. So you can create uh, these on something like Bitmoji, just create a, 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 a random silly image and then the students, I think the more strange the better because the students will then want to get the digital badges just to see what you're going to send them in terms of their sticker book. So that can be very simple, just boxes on a word template and they complete their sticker book as they go through the module. So the final one is just the digital platforms. Again, a lot of people might already be doing this, but if you're not, you know, again, now is the time to have a look. So I think Socrative is probably one of the most popular. So you can create uh, quizzes on there, but you can create races as well. So sort of the old school games where you roll the button and across the top at the fair, you have the same sort of thing on Socrative where rockets will go across. So the students can work in teams, even if they're going to be uh, remote, uh, and they can work together to answer all of those questions. So each one of these sites does a different thing. You've got Socrative for the races, Flip, which is becoming more popular for creating videos, who you can set up challenges on, and there are a few um, games within Quizlet as well. Okay, so it's very rapid. 10 ideas for uh, using games in remote teaching but they're the things that I can think of where you can include a game without having to be physically in the room with the students when you're doing it and because I think that's been a major issue for those of us that are into gamification where you would normally bring out your board game and your tabletop game and you can no longer do that how we're going to transfer that uh, into the remote environment and um, but there's some ideas and I hope some of them are of interest to you thank you very much Wonderful, Louise. Thank you very much for that. There's a vast number of um, great ideas in there. Um, was that was I right in thinking you were going to share the? You had a resource we could you were going to share with the those the PDF you mentioned. Yes, yes. So um, the the controller basically um, the main screen for it. You can click the buttons of the controller. So if you do just interest on the wiki adventure, that just takes you through to the wiki page. Um, so yeah, that'll be shared for everyone to access via lecture remotely. 
Oh, fantastic. That's, that is absolutely wonderful. Right, there, uh, there are some questions. The questions are coming up if anybody would like to type them into the chat, but I've got a few to... Well, I've got a comment to start off with. I, I really liked the, um, the petting game at the start. And my, my comment, your thoughts on it, I think this might be a very, we're going to have very limited lab-based time going forward, if, if any at all. And I, the games, I think, might be a great way of making the fine motor skills that we want them to develop when they're in the lab a, a useful and interesting experience rather than just going, can you just pet, pet out a hundred times? Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that as a, as a, as a way of making the lab, the limited laboratory time we've got interesting? Yeah, because I think if they are going to be in the lab, like I say, for a very limited amount of time, you want that to be a memorable experience. You don't want to think that they're traveling in or, you know, oh, this is the only lab time I get and all I'm going to be doing is for petting. So, you know, putting that into a different context means it will be more memorable for the students. Um, and it does mean that they can demonstrate those skills while having a little bit of fun as well. Um, I've even had students, uh, because we teach this in the spring semester at Derby, um, and I've had students come up to me after doing this exercise uh, and one memory that especially sticks in my head is two people that were on biomedical science and came up to me saying I'm really glad we did this because we've done it three times and now we've got it right and before we came in we've been useless through petting throughout the whole of the academic year to a point they said they were just going to quit because they thought well, if I can't even get petting then what's the point of carrying on yeah. so they were, they were at that point of going well I may as well not carry on with my degree because I can't even get this and by putting it into that different context they went oh I understand now what I'm doing wrong because obviously we did the game while explaining all those processes as well. So as you see people making these errors, you go, okay, well, how did you prepare? And then they show you and you, you can normally indicate, well, this is where you're going wrong. You're pushing to the wrong stuff or whatever it might be. And that's taken on more of, oh, now I can win the game rather than, oh, you know, it's skill development kind of thing. It's just absorbed in a different way. Fantastic. Um, my next question was about the capstone projects idea for the, the games. How, in order for... Um, you, I mean, you clearly have done this because you had it on your slides about doing the quality of analysis. Could you just expand a little bit on how you evaluated the games once you've made them such that they became the research project? The games itself or the, oh, well, the, the process? So the, the, the making of the game looked very robust and then the, the evaluation that you went through to see, well, was it a good game? Did it increase the learning? How did you, what, what sort of approaches did you take? Uh, a lot of it at this point has been questionnaire based. So like I say, it's even been a learning process for me of how to do this. So even just developing a suitable questionnaire um, for someone that's not used to that kind of thing uh, can be a little bit difficult. So we've, we often take that questionnaire approach for not overloading them with questions at the same time, because you've got the enjoyment factors to consider first of all, and then you've got the actual retention of that information and the understanding of it as well. Um, because I do think they're two different things. You can retain information and not actually understand what it means. So developing some kind of problem concept for them as well. Quite often, like I say, the students will go in, they will teach a session in a normal way, using a, a standard practical, and they will go in and they will do the game-based way as well. Um, and I've had students come back to me and say that looking at different abilities within the class as well, um, because obviously it's teaching, one size fits all is not you know, the way to go. I'm not saying that game-based learning is, you know, solves all problems, but it does cater for students who might struggle with different approaches. So dissertation students have reported, um, you know, students that have really uh, struggled. The teachers come up to them before and said, you know, this individual in the class might not, you know, understand what you're doing. So just so you're aware. And then they've done the game based approach and suddenly they're top of the class because it's presented in a different way to them. It's a way that they can assimilate it. And even the teachers have been surprised are going, oh, they've actually really you know, taken to this approach. So that qualitative analysis is partly observation as well, because I think that is very important as well as that questionnaire approach of just you know, ha simply have you enjoyed this session? You know, is it something that stayed in your memory? Um, if they can and they get it done early enough, I even get the students to go back and test that knowledge you know, six months later with the practical session versus the game session. And that's when you're looking at that true sort of retention of that information. Excellent. Brilliant. Thankfully, so the last thing I was going to, it's again, it's another comment question thing, but um, it's come up in a number of conversations and webinars that I've been in is this idea of don't fight the internet use the internet in the, yeah. in the in the way it's going forward and I very much like the the wiki example that you put up how, how much mapping did that take to you know to go through and create the journey path it, it's not too much if you're keeping it fairly simple especially like the, the example that was there that's just level four 
just the basic information, even just the you should know this rather than this is going to be on the exam. It's quite easy just to tick through, obviously being Wikipedia at the point when you do use it, you have to make sure that all the links are, are going to the right place. Um, but it depends on how complex you want to make it. If you just want 10 questions, this is a simple answer, then it's quite a short amount of time to be able to do it. If you want to start introducing, making it more complex or throwing in curveballs where possibly there's two very closely related answers, because anyone that's spent time on Wikipedia in the past, especially when you've been a student, are going, oh, that looks interesting, click, click, click. And you, you know, you start with DNA and then you end up on emu breeding or whatever it might be. <laughs> so just by that process, um, you can throw in those curveballs and see if they go down this path. And at what point do they go, hang on, <laughs> this yeah. isn't the topic that I started with. So you can make it as easy or as complex as you like, really. Um, I have been alerted to the fact that Wiki Adventure has been created somewhere else. I think it's to do with a, a charity one. I heard someone talking about it in a webinar. I haven't looked into it, but I'm aware that it's, it exists somewhere else as well, actually. Got it. Well, good, good ideas tend to appear in multiple formats. So that tells you a yeah. good idea, Louise. <laughs>